from Microbe TV. This is Tweevo, This Week in Evolution, episode number 98, hmm. recorded on February 14th, 2024. <laughs> Happy VD, everybody. I mean, Valentine's oh, Day. Sorry. That's, what can be I'm, more romantic than an uh, infection? We'll get there in a minute. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick joining me today from salt lake city nels ld hey vincent great to be with you happy valentine's day everyone we're back uh a little faster than usual we're ramping up the twivo energy here in anticipation <laughs> of a um <laughs> landmark episode twivo 100 which is not too far ahead we're really excited about this yeah so we have a date in uh, march that we're planning to do this in texas right now so we yeah. had to get, we had to get two more episodes in quickly because <laughs> i happened to be in texas yeah uh, for that week for south by southwest and so uh i think the sunday we're gonna we're gonna do that so stay tuned for details but what, what's the date march what yep yes. march 10th sunday march 10th mark your calendars um heavy dose of twivo for our <laughs> twivotarians out there um Big menu here. So we've got, it's just two weeks since Twivo 97. Uh, here's 98 today. Stay tuned, I think, next week or the following for uh, Twivo 99. And then, yes, mark your calendar for March 10th. This is going to be an event. This is a great coincidence that you'll be in the neighborhood. So we'll, <laughs> we will converge at the Science Mill in Johnson City, Texas for an in vivo presentation celebrating 100 episodes of this week in evolution. It's been a great ride, Vincent. I can't wait to um, celebrate yeah, this together. But yeah. well, we've been, so we do once a month, so it takes a long time to get to a hundred, right? So we started right. six, year, six years ago <laughs> or so, right? Yeah. And so who would have known that just as the calendar sort of dictated, we would um, sort of be able to, to, to come together. I can't wait. This is going to be so much fun. So stay tuned. We'll have more details. We'll, we'll be, we'll be back before, Twivo 100 with 99. And if anyone's in the sort of Texas area, San Antonio, I think we've had, as we go around the, um, you know, YouTube live stream audience, uh, and we've had some folks in Texas. So yeah, um, sure. if this is interesting to you, let's connect and, and stay tuned. Yeah. All right. Let me thank our moderators uh, before we get started here. We have Steph SF. We have Barb Mac UK. And we have Tom, who is uh, in Eugene, Oregon at the moment, and Les from California, and Andrew from New Zealand. Thank you for coming. It's double duty because tonight we have another live stream. <laughs> Fantastic. Great to have you all here. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Thanks for moderating. And thanks, uh, everyone else. Let's find out where folks are from. Philip is from Wales, Hello, Philip. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, let's see. Claire is from the UK. Great. Um, Emmy Wheeler is in Helsinki. Hello, hello. Minus two C. So let's see. What is it here in the U? Uh, in in New York, anyway. It is uh, one degree C. It's pretty chilly today. Yeah, we're a little warmer this way. That minus two C with a fresh coat of snow sounds like perfect sauna weather to me. <laughs> you bet. Jeremy is from Seattle. Welcome. And Tona is from Long Island. Rona. Rona. Wait. I f hi from Rona. Welcome. Welcome. Wait a minute. I, f I forgot what, what this means now. <laughs> Rona. Well, Rona is, is her name, I think, but yeah. she said Long Island in a, in a funny way before. All right. Anyway, uh, that's great it. to have you here. Only, yeah, that's that's who's here right now. I'm sure more people will wander in, stumble in. <laughs> that's great. We've, that's right. We've also thrown a curveball to our live audience, which is we're a couple weeks Early. ahead of pace yeah. here as we're as we're working in in here. So, but fun paper, Vincent, kind of building. Um, yeah, we got a few more people. Oh, here. yeah. Oh, sorry. Elizabeth, Let's keep. Yeah, Elizabeth yeah, yeah. from West Virginia. We have MK <laughs> from Massachusetts. Hey, you're Welcome. not late. It's only late. like. Yep. Five minutes and we're still fooling still, around. Still warming up, warming up the engines here. Duncan is from North Wales. Fantastic. Welcome. 
So the farthest so far is New Zealand, I believe, right? Yeah. And then we're, we also have some dots on the map up in Scandinavia as well, which is always really fun yeah. to uh, welcome our international audience to another episode of Tuivo. Long Island. Yeah. I met you. I know you came here. I totally remember you, Tona. I don't forget anybody who visits the incubator for sure. Uh, but Lawn Guyland, that's what I was looking for. <laughs> okay, welcome back. I would, I would have visitor. So Laura of Kip and Laura fame from San Francisco visited the incubator on mm, right. Monday. And then last mm. week we had uh, Pedro from Chile. Oh, wow. Which was yeah. fun. So if you want to visit, um, just send me an email, vincent at microbe.tv. We'll see if I'm around. And you can come by and look at this cool place, uh, this studio, which was put together from your donations. You know, this is yeah. all paid for by you guys. Yep. Right. So it's a public space, and the company is public. You know, nonprofits don't are not owned by anyone. Yep. Owned by I'll, the air. <laughs> no, I love this idea, and it you know it's um, spaces that celebrate science, right? And to Spaces have that celebrate science, there's a science yeah. mill does that, right? No, exactly. And so, um, in a few weeks, you know, about a month, we'll find ourselves in another one of these spaces that celebrate science and do a little behind the scenes tour, talk about that as we think about the six years podcasting together and, um, and our ongoing commitment to keep, continue to grow these conversations, these connections and try to build, uh, increasingly build spaces that celebrate science in new ways. That's really what we're up to. Hey, we have a new, mo another moderator peak. Fantastic. <laughs> who I believe is in college. Yeah. So he's been pretty busy. Haven't seen you around. Welcome back. Welcome back. Peak. <laughs> it's a good, it's a good handle. That's and you know, right. Nels, you see the viruses. Do you know which virus? It's a giant virus. Do you know which one it is? Oh, is that Tupan? Oh, very Fire? good, Nels. I'm yeah. impressed. I'm impressed. That's it. <laughs> I got lucky there. I just was reading that paper last week. I'm, ah. um, <laughs> and we actually just after I think we're going to get our hands on that virus, Vince, and I'm really? totally stoked about this. Yeah, it was a little bit of a delicate um, MTA or materials transfer agreement with um, uh, the lab in Brazil that discovered Tupan mm. virus, but um, are very willing to share it. And so, yeah, we've got some um, the. Um, it, it encodes everything in the translation apparatus, but the yeah. ribosome. No, it's wild. And it's not too far away from getting that too. Um, it's got a lot of the components, not all, as you're saying, but it, it has some, cool. one of the most fascinating viruses, I think, um, in all, yep. in all the ocean, so to speak, or also found in freshwater lakes. So yeah, big fan. <laughs> so according to Andrew, <laughs> Perth, Australia is the fur furthest from New York. Oh, there we go. We need another uh, moderator located in Perth. Not far. You're not far, Andrew. <laughs> we'll take yeah. it. That's <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Uh, what do we have on the menu? Let's see. Let me see. Okay. So let me just make a pitch for you folks to support Microbe TV. Yeah. Before we get started here. And of course, yeah. underneath the video window, there's a, a button you can push and donate some money if you want. Um, or you can go to Venmo. You can see the, the address above my head there. Or you can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. There are some other ways. Patreon, PayPal. You can write a check and send it to us at the incubator. Uh, we we love to get that. Uh, so it so all supports our, what did you call it? Space, spaces yeah. for science? S spaces that celebrate science. Help us build more spaces that celebrate science. I have to write that down here. Spaces that celebrate <laughs> science. It's cool. And yeah. that's what we've built at Microbe TV. You know, we have a calendar here. Too bad I can't have a remote hmm. camera. We have two months marked with all our shows. Cool. And it's just wow. almost every day there's something. And uh, it's science from scientists. Yeah. And uh, it's all for you. It's free. So help support that. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Speaking of science, yeah, our, Nels, what, what, do you, what do you got for us? <laughs> I was just going to finish with one. Thing. Yeah, I've, we've got a good one here. I'm excited, as usual, I guess. But um, I was just going to say, not only are we sort of spread out on points on the map, but the shows are also hitting every sort of science point on the map, too, right? You've got immune, you've got neuroscience, you've got virology, the, the original, yeah. all in, in a, kind of spreading far and wide on the topics as well, in and different ways to engage with each other on topics of science to celebrate science speaking of speaking of uh far and wide we're 
we're cooking up a new podcast. Oh, wow. On sports science. Great. Good idea. So the other day uh, hmm. on Twiv Angela, we started talking about exercise. She's an exercise freak. And so <laughs> then our producer, our editor, yeah. uh, Dave David, he's a big exercise guy. He wrote, he said, you should do this week in sports science. It'll be a big hit. There's nothing like it. <laughs> and I said to Angela, you'd be interested. Uh-huh. I don't want to do it, but Angela would do it. And then we need to get. Uh, some other person, and then uh, it would be cool to discuss papers in sports yep. science. Right? <laughs> that's a great, that's a, as we're just coming out of the shadow of the Super Bowl, for example, <laughs> that's a great way to think about uh, sort of common interests in broad audiences and connect with people on science. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, a lot of people are into exercise, and that's great. Mm-hmm. But now maybe you'd like to know the science of the exercise, you know? I'd love to yeah. get uh, Angela and another exercise guru on. That would be cool. But uh, we'll see. So so we're going to work on that in 2024. Very cool. I can already imagine uh, the possible acronym here. This week in sports science, TWIS. TWIS. Anyway. (laughs) It's a good one, right? (laughs) Uh, Put that on the rough draft pile for now. Okay. (laughs) Let's move forward here, Vincent. So we've got some fun science uh, with some evolutionary implications to consider. And this actually builds really beautifully, I think, on our last episode, Tuivo number 98, which was... Um, uh, germs that eat worms. So this is um, Mm -hmm. fungi, these uh, filamentous fungi that undergo these like crazy evolutionary switches. So we did that one. Now in today's episode 98, as you have it up here, the worms strike back. So we're looking at behavioral, the title of the paper, this was published, I think last summer in uh, Nature Communications is behavioral individuality determines infection risk in clonal ant colonies. And so the ants are the sort of victims of infection today <laughs> um, after we considered the, um, you know, worms being the prey of these fungal predators. Today, the worms strike back and are infecting clonal ant colonies. Um, and this touches on some really interesting or builds on some really interesting evolutionary implications. So we've got now um, how do sort of microbes or parasites control host behavior. And the ant system is sort of a perfect one to kind of um, tackle or a really valuable one, I should say, to tackle this question. Okay, authors. So let's um, step through the um, list of uh, sort of science heroes here. So we've got Zime Lee is the first author, uh, Bumika Bot, Eric Frank, uh, Talita Oliveira uh, Honorato, Fumika Azuma, Valerie Bachman, Darren Parker, Tomas Schmidt, Evan Economo, and the senior author, Yuko Ulrich. So in this group is sort of spread out in Europe, um, Max Planck Institute for Chemical Biology in Jena, Germany, the Institute for Integrative Biology in Zurich, Switzerland, and the Department of Ecology and Evolution at the University of Lausanne, also in Switzerland. Jena, now that's Jena. Jena, sorry. Um, I only know because I've been there. I've been there, so I, I learned how to pronounce it. Yeah, I was like celebrating getting through the author list uh, <laughs> and then let my guard, my pronunciation guard down there. Thank you, Vincent, for, for that important correction. Yeah, well, I'm not a great at pronunciation, but I, yeah, we went to a meeting <laughs> there. Yena is in the former uh, you... East Germany. It's a very interesting city. Yeah. Where I think um, some, some important German maybe composer lived. Hmm. I, I forgot who. I'll, I'll look it up but you can keep going. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, in the Max Planck Institute's all of these points on the map um, across Germany doing all of this exciting biology. This is one example um, of it. And so, as I said, you know, last time on Twebo, we talked about sort of the complexity or this, maybe the surprising complexity, biological complexity that can arise in that case from a predator prey relationship where fungi that we consider to be relatively simple um, are doing all of this kind of wild biology to trap, to lure in worms, trap them, and consume them. Um, This time the worms are the, not necessarily the predators, but they're the parasites um, in the sort of conversation. Um, This gets at the the impact of these parasitic relationships on social behavior. um, And, you know, the choice of the system, in this case, the clonal raider ants, really sort of hints at the um, power to understand this biology, to pull it apart using some kind of experimental frameworks here. And Vincent, the clonal raider ants are not new to Twivo. We've, <laughs> we've talked about this before. We had 
a guest on the show um, a while back, Daniel uh, Cronauer. <laughs> <laughs> he, has a, he has a book called Army Ants that we reviewed and interviewed, Daniel. Take a look. Yeah. This is uh, Tuivo, let's see, 62. What was the line that was the, that Daniel had? Uh, he said that these, these ants um, are the wickedest insects ever to roam the planet. That's right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and uh, Turns out they they take some worms for the ride, which may be just as wicked or even more so. We'll we'll delve into that um, today. Ants turn out to be super exciting. So not only did we talk to Daniel, but some of the folks working in his lab um, a few years back. This is episode eighteen of Tuivo. One of my favorite titles: Raiders of the Lost Orco. The gene was called Orco. <laughs> <laughs> this was your title, Vincent. Uh, in the the clonal raiders here. Um, check that out if you're interested. And then finally, uh, episode 13, we had a, another guest, Corey Moreau, who at the time I think was at the University of Chicago. She's moved now to Cornell. She's a champion of ants as a, a biological system for thinking about evolution, ecology, sort of how this all swirls together, these complex interactions. And so check out that episode number 13, This Week in Ants. I think we were briefly thinking about a podcast devoted to ants. If Corey no, we took asked Corey. Yeah. She, yeah. she said, I'm too busy. <laughs> Maybe another uh, uh, return scenario um, in the future there as well. We'll see. Okay. So um, that kind of sets the table for ants. Great research system. This, um, I would say an increasing reach of the genetic tools, largely because of Daniel uh, Cronauer's lab, a couple other groups that have picked up the chase here. Really interesting and important life history to consider. So a lot of asexual reproduction that is synchronized in the ant colony. And so as an experimentalist, that means you have sort of entire communities or populations that are nearly genetically identical. That's a huge, uh, you know, uh, sort of experimental control. If you can have all of the genetics sort of uh, as sort of kind of on a level playing field and then pick apart the other variables that are sort of influencing interesting biological outcomes. And because of that asexual reproduction as well, Vincent, the, the kind of timing or the age of the ants is synchronized. And the authors, you know, point this out and take advantage of this as well as they start to build out the study here and think about even pushing the system farther. So the reason, you know, I think ants have really gained the attention of evolutionary biologists, ecologists, um, and uh, sort of across the board is that they, you know, exhibit all these diverse behaviors, um, including, you know, division of labor, right? So they're genetically identical. And yet we can very clearly sort of um, immediately kind of intuitively see that you've got some of the ants that are dedicated their entire lives to taking care of the brood. They're, they're sort of nurse ants um, helping to keep the sort of colony perking along. And then other, you know, compared to foragers, for example, that are going out away from the nest to gain resources, bring back you know, leaf matter or whatever it is they're eating or hunting um, to sustain uh, the colony. So, you know, very simple seemingly as insects, but very complex as all of these sort of, you know, behaviors come together um, in, uh, you know, sort of the, the sum is more than the part, the sum is more than the parts. I don't know if I got that phrase right, but the, um, you know, the, the kind of things that you see um, emerging here. And here, this is all, you know, then the question becomes if a, a, an intruder, a cheater comes in a parasite, and we'll talk about the worms here in a, in a moment, the other half of the interaction, um, how do they influence host behavior or in some cases manipulate or control it? And this is a topic we've um, hinted at, I think on Tuivo, um, probably worth it to do some more papers along these lines in Tuivo is ahead. Um, but there's some really classic examples here. So actually, and some of them involve ants um, and fungi. So not the worms that we'll talk about today, but closer to sort of the last episode of Tuivo, where the fungi do this sort of wild biology. In this case, there's an entire genus of fungi. Some of the species um, will infect ants, um, change the behavior. So the ants will, for example, like, um, you know, start to be active at times when they usually wouldn't be. They'll climb to the top of trees, latch their jaws, onto mm -hmm. leaves and then the spores from the, or the fun, you know, the fungi will grow like a fruiting body and broadcast the spores all over. And so these, these cases, the ants are, are said to be like zombies. Um, parasitic wasps do this. There's viruses involved. There's other parasites, toxoplasma, which infects mice and 
and the mice change their behavior. They become attracted to the scent of cat pee. And this like continues the replication cycle as the cat eats the mouse and the toxoplasma goes between hosts. And so all of these really sort of wild examples um, that, you know, sort of raises the question of, is there um, microbial or parasite control of human behavior as well? A topic that's gaining some interest. I think the um, evidence so far is relatively thin. And that's in part because it's really hard to kind of get a handle on human behavior the way that you could, however, with an ant colony is much different. And so we can kind of advance or see how groups are advancing the science al along these sort of interactions or questions. And then maybe, you know, even sort of gaze back and think about how maybe some of this stuff might even be hiding in human populations as well in interesting ways. Okay, so that kind of, I think, sketches out a little bit of, you know, the biology here. Um, but so who's sort of in the driver's seat? And here the, um, the ants are vulnerable to a nematode worm. So we were talking about the worms getting trapped and hunted the last time on Twivo. This time the nematodes, it's in a genus called Diploscaptor. It's a cousin of C. elegans, which is the prey in, in the last episode, um, infect the, the heads of ants. Uh, and they actually, it's not just sort of a random scenario. Mm -hmm. I think the, before this work was reported, there were some ideas along these lines and this paper really kind of advances or formalizes, I think, some of the ideas. And so these ant or these uh, worms go to the pharyngeal gland in the head of the ant. And so it's kind of an interesting landing spot here because that gland is involved in nutritional um, uh, transfer, nutrient transfer from ant to ant, some of the social behavior, including signaling molecules. And these are the so-called cuticle hydrocarbons um, that ants use as they interact with each other to sort of mediate um, some of the social interactions that uh, gain in this complexity and then underlie sort of the ability of a colony of ants to work um, as more than the sum of its parts. So, um, uh, so the, I, that kind of sets the stage for some interesting evolution, right? So when two genomes collide, in this case, it's the ant genome with the worm genome, usually genetic sparks fly. And so that's kind of where this paper uh, picks up the action. So, you know, the, the work that, that was reported here, the first um, sort of um, attack on the system is to just confirm that this interaction is happening. And so actually, um, speaking of our uh, moderators and Andrew at all points the, the, uh, on the map, the ants here were collected from New Zealand. Mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> I don't know the whole backstory here um, or, or why that turned out to be the place um, where they did the, sort of the field work. That, that underlies um, the research here. But then with those ants, they had some suspicion that they'd be associated with this nematode worm, the diploscaptor in the diploscaptor genus. And so they just immediately did some sequencing to just get a handle on that. And indeed they found um, the worms, put that into sort of a phylogenetic tree. They also, and then they do um, sort of this medical procedure on the ants, right? These micro CT scans um, of the infected ant heads. And that sort of confirmed or, or gave some of the morphology here. In fact, <laughs> these worms were where they expected. They were in the pharyngeal glands. Um, and so I think previous work had, had sort of laid out the idea that the worms might be doing this sort of to gain an advantage. They might be commensals. They're just trying, they're, they're not causing any harm. They're just hanging out in the ant heads in this gland for whatever reason, and that helps them to disperse. And so what the authors were kind of curious about in this case is there's sort of more going on underneath the hood here. Is this more than just a a um, commensal scenario is there actually a parasitic situation and so they set up some experimental infections now that they had sort of the system had taken the system from the field into the laboratory and then they can you know look for signs there's not a lot of veterinarians or you know or uh, physicians that think about ants but this is almost like the approach that we see not only with the micro ct scans but then to sort of watch the ant behavior and the ants look sick so there, this, you know, this has sort of been <laughs> contrast to a commensal scenario. They have reduced survival. And then, you know, sort of the language or the, ge the genetic underpinnings of this, they can start to approach that by sequencing the genomes of the um, infected or the transcriptome. So what are the genes that are being turned on that might mediate the responses of the infection, the, the host to the infection, the ants as they're dealing with these worms. And in fact, they see hundreds of genes that are upregulated. And the categories um, of these genes inc include immune system functions, wound healing. And so that sort of implies that there's damage 
being sort of inflicted by the worms that the ants are dealing with. Um, and then interestingly, in getting at that sort of social behavior angle here, um, that's the focus of the work, um, behavioral uh, or genes that fall into categories that influence the behavior, including things like aggression. So a lot of genes that have been linked to that process um, of social behavior are changing in the infected versus the uninfected ants. So um, that's, you know, starts to now this isn't just sort of a, a evidence that this isn't just sort of a commensal scenario where um, the ants don't really care, the worms sort of hitch a ride and get off, there's more going on here. And so the, um, the hint here that there could be more happening um, for the worms that could have a negative impact on the ants comes from the fact that there's a big difference in the cuticle hydrocarbon composition between the infected and uninfected. And I guess here's where the, you know, being in the Institute for Chemical Biology comes in handy. So now they're using techniques to sort of figure out what are the composition of the small molecules that you usually find um, in the ants that are not infected and comparing that to the infected ones. Um, and so there, and this is pretty different sort of in um, quality and quantity, uh, hinting at, so, you know, social impacts, right? If you're messing with the, kind of the chemical cues, the sick that are involved in signaling and behavioral responses. Um, if the worms are eating that for lunch, that might change your behavior was the <laughs> hypothesis that sort of grew out of, uh, out of the work so far. And so here is where they could, so now that, you know, by just doing that kind of survey, observing what happens or comparing infected versus uninfected, that launched the idea or the hypothesis um, that there, there could be, um, you know, basically uh, an impact here, a social impact, and also uh, pointing to this sort of parasite interaction. So they take advantage of the system to, um, you know, manipulate it in ways or set up experiments to determine if there's a link between the infection and the social organization of the ant colony. And so that's where, you know, having this system, you can really kind of push that these ideas forward and really get at the heart of some of these questions in ways that you can't. Let's say if we're just thinking about like, even our own species and what's possible or not as we're, we're trying to understand some of this interesting biology. Okay, so here it's like a fun moment for like the behavior, not just of the ants, but of the worms. So they do an ambush style of infection. Um, and their hypothesis was that if they look at the two major classes of sort of behavioral types or the division of labor in the ant colony, that the nurse, the sort of nurse ants that are hanging out in the brood would be less susceptible to infection compared to the foragers that are out there. Mm. And that's, you know, kind of builds off the idea that the, the worms are out there in the environment kind of waving their hands. Do you like, it's made me think of those, um, you know, these used car dealerships where there's those like, um, yeah. In yeah. the front where there's those, those inflatable those, things that go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And they're all, yeah. <laughs> yes. I think that's what the worms do basically is that a version well, it's kind of, of like a questing behavior, right? <laughs> where yeah. uh, ticks will quest, right? They stand on the grass with their, I don't yep. know, but they call this nictation, which I think nictation is, is the technical the, term. So the worms <laughs> actually stand up on vertically and they wave in three dimensions. Exactly. Just, and then they figure, by doing that, they're going to hit an ant that's. <laughs> that's right. Like literally grab on and then um, gain a, you know, gain a hitch a ride, so to speak, yeah. or move now into the ant head uh, from there. So the next time you're at a drive by a used car dealership, just point at that inflatable thing that's waving around and Nictation. say it's, it's nictating. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. So here's, <laughs> so to test that idea or to see if that, you know, that uh, um, there was some experimental evidence for that. They now did a pretty extensive, like 200 plus day experiment that involves um, four cycles of the ant colony. So basically I think, you know, divide by four. So about every 50 days, there's a new brood that comes up um, in the ant sort of system. And remember, these are all kind of roughly synchronized in age. All the brood hatches it in one cycle all at the same time. And so what they noted is over sort of a 50 day so period. Before of, you do that, yeah, tell yeah. people how they infect them. Remember? They uh, put them on agar plates. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, of course. With yeah. nematodes. So they put the ants in an agar plate that has nematodes yes. in them. They yes, let them yep. stay in there for a while. And, and the nematodes are nictating. <laughs> and they, they latch right. onto the ants. I think yes. that's pretty cool. Very cool. Yeah. So the, the then, ants are captive because the, the agar dish, you know, has high sides. So they, they got to stay in there for a while. 
Exactly. So they've got, and they're kind of, and throughout the paper, they're doing that kind of con, on the auger plate type of infection, um, where then they can take the, for example, the infected ants, put them back into a colony, um, right. sort of mixed populations, uninfected, infected. Um, they can also kind of just as the colony is running, um, have the ants, uh, sort, you know, the foragers go out, um, become infected through this exact means, and then, you know, see basically what's the progression um, of the infection. And so what they found is that um, in that first call, in that sort of first cycle, the first, I guess, 40 days, probably closer to 40 than 50 days, um, that there is an increase of infection in the um, foragers relative to the nurse ants. Um, and then as they go through each cycle, cycle two, another 40 days, cycle three, et cetera, cycle four, they note that all everyone becomes infected in the whole colony, both the um, nurse ants in the nest, um, but the load of infection, the number of worms, sort of the burden of them continues to grow or become higher in the in the foraging ants. And so they attribute this to um, potentially repeated infections, right? The ants keep going out again and again, and they are exposed to these like used car sales, um, <laughs> nictating uh, worms and um, end up being uh, and then sort of circulating them around the colony. So then, so that already sort of is interesting, um, and we'll probably return to this idea in a few minutes, but this already kind of hints at, you know, is there, um, as there's this division of labor, how, if that impacts infection differently, does it sort of compartmentalize or like you might, the nurse uh, ants might be safe for a while at all, all, all of those dynamics mm. um, can start to be part of the um, sort of evolutionary equation here, so to speak. Um, but at the same time, you know, then now that this is happening, it's sort of also on the worm side, does this influence the behavior of the ants, which might actually favor the dispersal or the ability of the worms to get more nutrition as they parasitize the ants? And so that's kind of the next focus of the study that they report is um, what's going on with the behavior. And so they can do automated tracking of the infected versus uninfected ants. And so this gets to your point or the the petri dish, right? So you mm. can, in controlled ways, just say, okay, this group of ants is now infected. This is not. And then um, using automated tracking, basically, you know, video cameras that are recording, how much are they moving? What's the quality of their movements, et cetera. Um, as they put them back into the sort of experimental colonies, they notice that the foragers um, that are of the infected foraging ants spend more time um, with the nurse ants in the nest. Hmm. Um, and that even the uninfected ants in colonies with infected ants show a reduction in activity. So there's, you know, so that hints again at that, you know, they're, the worms are probably messing with some of the signaling cues as they're just eating that for or like a snack or, you know, whatever dinner. Um, and so that's now even influencing the uninfected ants in that scenario. And so the idea here is that um, kind of a, a side effect or a consequence of this is that there's a decrease in the division of labor. The foragers look more like nurse ants and the nurse ants are also a little bit kind of pokey. And so everyone's just kind of hanging out. And this, uh, you know, a consequence of this is that you would um, see um, so less of a division of labor and a higher density of hosts hanging out together. And so, you know, again, sort of evidence, sort of um, a great example of how scientists use evidence as they're advancing a study to then make a new sort of hypothesis. And in this case, it would be that that change in behavior might facilitate um, the uh, spread of the infection or the ability of the of the worms to get more access to the resources in the ant colony. And so we, the, should, these, we should point yeah. out that this, so th this makes sense for the worm, right? Because the denser colony, more transmission, more places to reproduce. So so uh, Nell said, you know, the, the infection drives the workers into the nest, right? Mm -hmm. It's not a conscious thing on the part of the worm. This is something that has evolved over many years, right? Some years ago, this didn't happen. And there was randomly a worm where when that worm got into an ant, it somehow drove it into the nest. And that was selected for because that, yes, worm, that ant in the nest then spread to everyone else. And they all had that same property. So it's, it's not... Yeah, it's very hard to think of this, but it's random. It's, yes. No, nobody's, the worm is not saying, hmm, how could I get into more ants? No. <laughs> yes, you're exactly right. And this is, I think it's an important moment to sort of pause and say, this is an example of evolution at work, right? It kind of, yeah. it, 
it reveals how these really simple random processes like selection can act on that. And I think right. usually we tell the stories backwards, right? So, and we did this even today, I mentioned these zombie ants where the fungi in that case changes the ants into zombies. And that's sort of the most, you know, wild behavior. Um, uh, and, and I think because of the way we talk about it is by putting that forward, it sounds complicated. Like, you know, how did the fungi figure out, quote unquote, figure out how to do that? And it almost has this sort of, you know, um, uh, sort of like what, what's what's possible here. And I think what's beautiful about this work is it's exactly what you're saying, Vincent. It sort of reveals how these really simple kind of um, inputs into a biological system as different species come together can have these consequences. And so all you need to think about is, you know, can a worm get a meal? But if the meal happens to be in a gland that where the carbon source is exactly the signaling molecules, now that impinges on the behavior. And so, so like, like you're saying, selection can act on the worm side, but as a side effect that changes the behavior. And now you're on this pathway kind of from an evolutionary standpoint where more selection can happen. Things can get even more complicated. We, let's say we come back in a million years, all of a sudden these worms are like making the <laughs> ants into zombies because they're sort of, they, they, yeah, this is all sort of playing out right before your eyes. So it's a really interesting snapshot, I think, of that process of how different species um, as they interact, complexity can evolve from sort of simple interfaces to begin with. All you need is mutation and selection, right, Nels? Mutation and selection, and um, and selection meaning which mutations make it into the next generation, right? right? And that's sort of the motion, the evolutionary motion yep. here. Yeah. Okay, so then, you know, again, they've got like all the, the ability to really control these ant colonies, these radar ant colonies in the lab. And so they can start to test these ideas that we're talking about um, by mixing, uh, so about parasite load, by uh, mixing infected ants into the uninfected colonies and observing the transmission between the ants. And so that's an important link here, right? So the, I, we've, they've put forward the idea that the ability of the, um, of the worms to potentially change that behavior, increase host density. So the prediction or the hypothesis that that raises is that you know, you'd see, you'd observe transmission of the worms between the ants um, as you play with those variables, you know, and, and look at infection load. And so this becomes sort of, you know, infection epidemiology for ants. Um, we mostly do epidemiology or think about that for things like SARS-2, human viruses or pandemics. Here are the same principles or, or approaches are really val valuable for sort of formally looking at these ideas in these experimental systems. Um, and so take it all together as, and, and I should say, so they do have a, find evidence that there's a transmission advantage basically, or a possibility that the worms, um, are, are, are gaining that advantage through this manipulation of the behavior of the ants. The foragers become more like nurses, but now they're all hanging out together and transmission goes up of the parasite. So very, you know, um, uh, puts it very squarely into the idea that the nematodes, the worms here are facultative larval parasites. We kind of glossed over that, but when they were doing those micro CT scans, the worms themselves are, in, are kind of locked into sort of an early larval stage. There's some interesting, probably counter evolution or selection at play here, where it would be to the advantage of the ants to stop <laughs> being parasitized because it's, we're seeing all this wound healing, all these immune responses. And so, you know, this is also not sort of a free ride for the worms by any mean as well, by any means as well. And so at this step, sort of in that evolutionary relationship, it'd be described pretty squarely as a facultative parasite scenario. That means that the worms don't necessarily depend on this to spread, but that there's at least in some parts of the population, kind of that advantage to gain resources. And again, sort of raises, I think that interesting possibility, if you come back in a few million years or whatever, um, will they be not facultative, but sort of dependent parasites, if those are the only worms that sort of survive or, you know, or, or, or depending on how the environment changes or the accessibility to resources, the accessibility to host these ants, but they, they don't need to be a parasite. And this kind of echoes a little bit, I would say on our last Twivo, remind, remember in that case, the worms are the prey, the predator is mm -hmm. a fungi, but those fungi that were trapping nematodes, were only doing it when the nutrients were low, right? And so you've got this sort of flexibility in lifestyles. Um, that comes up and how 
you know, the advantages can change in a sort of a dynamic environment. And, and that's also um, completely worth kind of putting that complexity um, into the equation as well. As you start to um, think about uh, how these things can sort of unfold, and so we we kind of mentioned this, you know, this is the what's the mechanism here for the worm? You're just getting nutrition, and then the side effect is that this is altering the ant's behavior um, and starts to get at a pathway towards behavioral control. A really and simple that, mechanism, right? Yeah. So, so the, the alteration of behavior is to theory to facilitate transmission, have more hosts, but. You can't destroy the ant colony, right? And if the yeah. ants, if the workers stay in the nest, they're not going to be getting food. So I, I, they don't really address this. But you're right. Yep. At some point, this has to reverse, right? Because yeah. Or there's otherwise a balance. The, otherwise, the colony will collapse. <laughs> Correct. And that's I think that you'd predict from evolutionary or theory that that would happen constantly, right? It's almost like these natural experiments taking mm. place. And in most cases, because this is kind of these random collisions with um, different um, outcomes, maybe nine times out of 10, the colony might collapse depending on how successful the uh, worms are or how strong the ants immune response is. But then if there's, um, you know, a way forward, both for the uh, ant colony and for the population of worms, that's the thing that will persist sort of from generation mm -hmm. to generation. And so that's probably being kind of litigated in raider ant colonies around New Zealand and in other places um, where um, scientists are able to see this interaction sort of right before their eyes. But yeah, it's sort of, it's in that, again, I think you're, you're hinting at or you know, getting at a really important topic on Tuivo, which is that a lot of the evolution that unfolds is stuff that we never see because it's missing from the sort of record. It's almost invisible. It's all of those yeah, experiments, sure. right? Where yep. it failed. It was a mutation where a selection said, no, <laughs> that's not a way forward. And then it's just what we observe are sort of these kind of intermediate points or snapshots along the way for those sort of rare survivors. That's why uh, SARS-CoV-2 yeah. is interesting because we can see selection happening in real time, right? Yeah. So we've really, you know, just as sort of the timing of this pandemic, I don't think it's necessarily different than other coronavirus pandemics, but we have this like high resolution genetic yeah. view that we've never had before. Now up to something like 15 million or more um, genomes that you can compare on a website um, to actually see those genetic changes. And I think the current um, JN.1 variant is sort of one of these um, sort of, you know, um, genetic jumps that happened um, in the emergence of Omicron a couple of years ago. It's now taken over for in, in the US, for example. Um, the good news here is that case number, even as that variant dominates, the case number seem to be going down uh, kind of, you know, in the seasonal pattern to some degree. But yeah, that's uh, um, most of the viruses um, from even a few months ago in the, or the lineages are now extinct. They're gone. They've failed or they've, you know, haven't passed that selection test relative to this other one. And so we just, it's sort of the same theme playing out, but in sort of different kind of, you know, uh, environments or sort of in this case, you know, with all the social behavior of the ant colony and the parasite sort of having these implications on behavioral control. Now is SARS-2 controlling our behavior? That's another interesting question, right? So yeah, certainly well, sure, to some sure. degree, right? <laughs> um, well, yeah, uh, in overt ways <laughs> like masking and Mm -hmm. shutdowns and closing schools and all that stuff. Right. But, yep. um, I think psychologically it's had an impact, a uh, long-term impact that's just being quantified. So, yeah, I mean, all viruses affect your behavior. Polio virus really affects your behavior because you can't move around. So you have to do other things, right? That's right. Yeah, exactly. And so I think it's worth it to sort of, um, you know, keep an open mind to how some of the patterns or concepts that emerge from research like this applies of course, across, including to our own species. Yeah. Yep. No question. Okay. So, um, so, you know, a somewhat, I would say, um, putting on our, um, you know, reviewer hats here, our podcast peer review, Vincent, we always like to, you know, kind of be, a, um, keep an eye on that as well, sort of lift up the science, but sort of identify points where, um, things are, um, you know, still TBD or um, sort of approaches is, I would say, you know, overall, um, the modification of behavior is somewhat modest. So we have like, it's, we've, we've seen, or they highlight kind of these two, you know, main jobs for the colony. One is nurse ants, one is foragers. That kind of simplifies, I think, 
the division of labor here? And the, you know, is there more beneath the surface here in terms of kind of the nuances of how the whole colony is working? Are there sort of subgroups of ants, right, that have kind of even more specialized jobs? And is that part of the of the story? Very well could be. I think that's, you know, kind of highlights actually the value of the system for future work is now that they've really kind of put this onto a more firm footing in terms of the facultative parasitic behavior of the worms to the ants and sort of hinting at the behavioral control. Can they really push this to the next level? And so here. Right, by the way, of, I think, I yeah, think they yeah. can, they can knock out genes in the, in the worm and see which ones are involved in this control, right? Excuse me. Exactly. They can knock out, yeah, they can mess with the worms um, yeah. and even more so they can mess with the ants as right. well from a genetic yeah. basis. Right. And so that was Twivo 18 Raiders of the Lost Orco. They, did a genetic ma manipulation to take out the orco, I think, or olfactory receptor or yeah. part of that system um, to see the impact. And so, yeah, and this gets at this really cool, again, thinking about behavior, right? That division of labor, uh, thinking about that as a host defense. So the fact that you're much more likely to be infected if you're out kind of, you know, going through used car sales lots and hitting these nictating, nictating um, uh, worms, means that there's a compartmentalization possible with these infections and that you might limit spread to the greater you know, population. So for example, are there mechanisms in place where there are like, I'm thinking about more in my sort of pretty um, shallow knowledge of, um, of bee colonies, right? Are there ants or in that case bees that are as, um, you know, foragers are returning to the nest or the hive that are trying to determine, should we let this guy back in have, or have they become infected in, into the protection of the colony? And so I think there's all kinds of interesting, uh, you know, in addition to the behavioral kind of control impacts on the complexity of the colony and, and sort of how the members of the population um, analyze um, the danger of uh, the foragers as they return. And so I don't know um, enough about the system. It might be that again, this is one of those cases where if you come back in a million years, that selection would act along those lines. The clonal raider ants would become, you know, there'd be another division of labor, which would be sort of the guard ant. Maybe that exists I don't, you know, already. <laughs> it just hasn't been sort of put into this framework with the parasite. Um, but I think that sort of, again, gives you this idea of how things can become more complex as, as you put a parasite into the mix. Um, and so, the, yeah, that's sort of where they leave us, actually, is kind of this snapshot of this host parasite in, uh, interaction. I would say, we're, you know, compared to some systems, relatively early um, from an evolutionary scale. But then, but when two genomes collide, the genetic sparks fly and then selection can act to sort of, to, you know, sort of uh, increase the complexity. It might be that the worms are like, you know, making these ants into zombies. If we come back in two million years, it might be that the ants figure <laughs> out how to shut them out altogether, and those are the, those are the ones that dominate into the future generations. But usually, it ends up these interfaces that, you know, they sort of persist or find this sort of balance point um, where both parties move forward with one not completely dominating the other. If, if if there is domination on one side or the other, then the danger is that becomes an extinction event or all, or that complexity that might've evolved for a while gets sort of pushed to the wayside as the worms sort of, you know, fend for themselves in the soil and don't spend their time in the pharyngeal glands of raider clone, or, uh, uh, these army ants, the ra the clonal raider ants. Yeah. I think, um, so, so the two questions I have here are, mm -hmm. how does the colony recover from this, which is we do, we already talked about, and also because if, if the ants stay in the colony, they're not they're going to die. So, how does that work? And um, what's the mechanism of uh, modifying the behavior? It's obviously involving chemical signals of some kind, right? Um, so the, the the nematode is in there in the pharyngeal gland, and then maybe they're maybe they're normal. Uh, chemicals dispersed that tell the ants to go outside and this mm -hmm. is interfering with that or maybe it's a positive thing that telling chemicals telling it to go back because i'm sure there are those as well i think that yep. would be interesting to sort out right absolutely yeah and then that becomes since that's already a signaling molecule right between the ants if there is sort of a reproducible difference as the worms are just snacking away on the hydrocarbons um then that you know for a potential guard ant that could be the signal, right? Yeah, Is, yeah, oh, yeah. wait, usually you give me these hydrocarbons. They're not here. 
that makes me suspicious. And so how, how selection acts on that sort of sensing and responding as that reads out like into the kind of, you know, neural circuits mm -hmm. that are, the, that are unfolding in the, in the amp ream, That's exactly, I think a really cool direction. And if you can manipulate those circuits, which you can given the genetic tools here and, and already what's known about some of this, that really allows you to unlock the possibility of getting at these, you know, the, the mechanisms both yeah. on the sort of host and the parasite side. Yeah. So there, there's a word here, two words that I want to highlight because they're pretty cool. Uh, first, so it's the ants could be extra needle or intra needle, and mm -hmm. needus in Latin means nest. Yeah. So you could be outside the nest or inside the nest. So that's mm -hmm. cool. But the reason I bring it up is because there is an order of viruses called the nidoviralis, mm -hmm. and those mm -hmm. include the coronaviruses. They're called nido because their mRNAs are nested. They overlap each other, right? So yeah. there's a long one and a shorter one and a shorter and a shorter and a shorter, and they're all overlapping like a nest. So yep. they call them the nido virales. And here <laughs> now we have ne extra needle and intraneedle activity, or maybe it's nidal. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, no, that's right. And actually, the I think the imagery here of the nest is important too, not only, you know, for the like, literal kind of composition or arrangement <clears throat> of the ant colonies, but actually some other groups, you get these almost like nesting, um, you know, sort of scenarios of interaction. So yeah, yeah. not only to the, I mean, there's a whole lot more going on here with the pharyngeal glands and other sort of secretory actions of the ants. And so, you know, the ants, for example, the leaf cutter ants are a really interesting species that go out, they get leaves, not to actually consume themselves, but to, they use that their farmers growing fungi on the leaves. And then the fungi can get infected with bacteria. And so the ants now, you know, are like secreting antibiotics hmm. to keep their fungi clean that are growing on the leaves that the ants collected. And then you can add a parasite like a worm in there and you get these sort of it's not just sort of we've, we've been talking about this as sort of simple two component interaction or two genomes colliding. When in a lot of these cases, it can be, um, you know, three genomes, four genomes, five, like it, the whole kind of yeah. conglomeration of interfaces and interactions that sort of play out in these nesting fashions. And so, yeah, I think that also is like a, a really cool um, part of systems like this. I mean, I'm kind of mixing and matching um, ant species here in behaviors, but it sort of just illustrates um, what can happen um, in uh, out there in the ant hills or, you know, sort of related ecological spaces. All right. Uh, we have some questions here. You want to look at those? Uh, yeah, fantastic. All right. So <laughs> here's Tom. He says, uh, if a clonal population, yeah. the question is what cues lead to labor role division and does it change for a particular ant, environment, age, location, and colony? Uh, yeah. The answer is yes. And, um, <laughs> you know, I wish we had Corey Moreau here or Daniel Cronauer to do this justice. So the authors of this study point out that, so, you know, we t we've talked about as um, asexual reproduction, but it turns out you know, mutation, there's still a mutation rate, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, this doesn't matter for division of labor. That's all, even within sort of 100% clonal, um, this sort of plays out um, in how individuals in the population are sort of where they're brought up, what are the sort of environmental cues they're exposed to, and, and then they kind of go down those pathways. But I think what's important here is that from a kind of bigger picture, um, in terms of like, how does evolution act in, uh, for these behaviors to sort of unfold or change over time, division of labor, things like that, there is a little bit of genetic variability. So that's where there's random mutations where selection can act. And so there has to be some level, it can't be, I mean that, so, or if you're a hundred percent perfect, um, you know, let's say there's a mutation where the DNA polymerase that's involved in the replication of genomes figures it out and is hundred percent the, the prediction is the colony will become more brittle because there's no, like it might work great for a while. And that's sort of, you know, as a um, genetic entity, you'd love to get hundred percent of your genes into the next generation. Um, um, you know, uh, a lot of, re uh, species that mate are uh, mm. sort of the, the Valentine's day tangent here. Why do we put up with mating and all of these, you know, why do we spend so much time making, uh, Valentines and giving them out to other people will sacrifice 50% of our genetic material into the next generation. And the idea is that by diversifying genetically, that actually gives a foothold or a balance 
yeah. against parasites, against predators, against, you know, and so, um, you know, that's also playing out here. And so, yeah, great question, Tom. I think the answer there is, is exactly, it's related to all of those factors, environment, age, location in the colony, and then the cues that get interpreted by the genome and sort of push you down these different developmental pathways that then play out in the differences, for example, of being a, a nest ant caring for the brood versus a, um, a, a nurse ant caring for the brood versus a forager that's out there gaining food for the, for the whole colony and then bringing it back so that everyone can move forward with those resources. Uh, MK says, this meshes nicely with the recent TWIP and the mm. ants as intermediate hosts to a tapeworm keep being kept alive longer. Right. Really good point. Agreed. Yeah. And that gets at that kind of nesting idea, the NIDO idea that we're, that Vincent brought up, right? Which is that you kind of bring in more players um, and all of a sudden, you know, you get into these complex life histories that involve like, you know, various hosts along the way in ways to um, sort of um, increase the chance of genes moving into the next generation. Um, there's also, you know, there's danger, like, so all of this, I think I, I don't, I want to be careful not to talk about this. Like, you know, complexity is always good. Um, there can also be cases where if you're now depending on three species for your life history or for your, your um, life replication, um, and one of those species goes extinct. And, you know, mm -hmm. if you're, if you have to, to kind of move through several intermediate hosts, that could be a more brittle sort of lifestyle here as well. And so complexity can crash out as well. And so it's actually wild to me that we see all these complex scenarios um, that are seemingly stable for really long intervals of time. So Tom says brittle colony <laughs> syndrome, which is what you were talking about there. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Um, right. Tona says, isn't it true that ants have exceedingly similar brains to humans, like greater than 90%? Ooh, wow. I don't, uh, that's an interesting idea. I don't, by what measure would be 90% of what <laughs> um, would be important there. So certainly, yeah, there are, you know, there's neuronal circuits here, sort of the currency of um, inputs from the environment and responses um, from the, in this case, the ant, but, you know, relative to the, so, you know, this is an invertebrate system, right? So no backbone, no spinal cord. Um, and so um, I wouldn't describe it as primitive, but I would describe it as different. Um, yeah. Um, just yeah. in its sort of fundamental organization. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, so folks, if you uh, are here, there are 51 of you, 28 likes, please hit the like button below the video. It doesn't cost you anything. And can help us to spread the word of these shows even uh, further and wider. There was a question here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here, it's not related yeah. to what we're talking about, but I think Nels would like it. It's mm. from Tona also. Great. Uh, in the yeah. news today, stingray mm. pregnant with no male in sight for years. Can you just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my favorite. So I have to um, uh, go to even a different species here a little off topic which is our crayfish so there's a marbled crayfish talking about no male in sight so it was a female crayfish that somehow became parthenogenic somehow so there was like in the germline some um gen genomic gymnastics that led to like an entire extra copy of all of the chromosomes and somehow encoded in that was mm -hmm. the ability to uh, cut males out of the action. So now, and this is like in a pet shop in Texas or in Germany, I forget. And then now this crayfish is sort of spreading far and wide because you can, you know, you can buy one at the pet shop, put it in your aquarium at home, come back in a few weeks and you've got 50 crayfish with that. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. so why don't, and this, this is perfect, Tona, because it's like exactly goes back to our conversation from a minute ago, which is, um, brittle, brittle colony syndrome. So if you're co completely asexual, um, it, or in this case, a parth parthenogenic, so this pregnant sting rape, maybe there's a similar story kind of behind, um, the, uh, beh behind this one as well. Um, that's a great, you know, uh, way to like, let's say on Valentine's day, you don't want to put in the energy of, of attracting a mate, finding a male, um, if there's a way to reproduce without that, which comes up like constantly in nature, examples of this, whether it's potentially stingrays or certainly crayfish, um, all kinds of asexually reproducing microbes out there. 
Um, this can seem like a, a great way to like not waste the resources on finding a Valentine and instead moving forward with getting a hundred percent of your genetic material into mm -hmm. the next generation. But that's the no, sort it's of dangerous. The, it's dangerous, right? Exactly. So then it's sort of one of those blind alleys that you lock down. And all of a sudden, if you have a pandemic level sort of scenario with an infectious microbe and there's no genetic diversity, meaning yeah. that, you know, the entire population is vulnerable to that. You can get these extinction sort of crash level events, um, to unfold. And so, so we think yeah. that sex evolved in, to fight parasites, basically. That's the idea. Yeah. The parasitic red queen hypothesis yeah. takes all the running you can do to stay in the same place. And here all the running involves, um, diversifying your genetic material yeah. to have that resiliency somehow built in. So there are some species that are parthenogenic, but there are no, there are no mammals that are that way, right? Ooh, great question. I think off, not off the top of my head. Usually when I say something definitively, then uh, the exceptions will come forward. Um, but no, I think, um, so certainly the vast majority, so I think mammals, have probably tried it. There have been cases where something like this might have arose, but it hasn't like persisted enough, or it's so rare that that you know it's almost like a shooting star um, uh, that that might you might glimpse at for a moment in evolutionary time. Um, but what we see all around us, right, are, is the complexity, the diversity of mating systems. I mean, I love that. So, like again, going to um, you know some of the single cell critters that swim around in ponds. There's a great model system. I spent my PhD worrying about this tetrahymena thermophila it has seven mating types. And so depending <laughs> on the environment, depending on the temperature or the kind of composition of other, um, you know, um, clonal cells around, you can switch to seven mating types or, or the cells can do that. And then they have all like, there's just all of these ways of, div again, diversifying your genetic portfolio that emerge in nature, um, that are probably, um, uh, an outcome of the parasites or the ability of viruses and other um, microbes to, to sort of uh, exert their own uh, sort of reproductive capacity and to gain resources in the environment. Many, many, some people say that humans will not need males in so many years. You know, the females will <laughs> reproduce parthenogenetically. Right. I, I mean, I don't, I have no idea, but there's no examples in mammals. So that's why I asked because it's not going to just happen in humans, right? Yeah, but sex chromosomes are known. So the Y chromosome is sort of in this like state of decay that people have like pointed out, which is really interesting. Um, yeah. But the prediction would be um, if that really happens, that females cut males out of the action, and you know, fair enough. Like I could, I can see some uh, reasons to to potentially go to, <laughs> down that road again over millions of years, or you know, hundreds of generations, or something like that. That would be the prediction is that if yeah. it's truly a parthenogenic scenario and, and genetic complexity go, complexity goes down, that that's not sustainable. But by the way, that's what, you know, that's sort of, there's no sort of, you know, guiding hand here that says yeah. that, that yeah. you know, that you shouldn't crash. This isn't like kind of an engineer running life. This is just all of the random collisions and the outputs over long, long time periods. So Peter has a question. How, any idea how the genetic composition of the queen managed to develop all the different behaviors for all the different colony member ants from the yeah. first ant species? Multi-mutations? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So one point here with this system is they're queenless. So this is asexual reproduction. They've let go of the queen. But for other, you're exactly right, Peter, in other species, the, that's the whole basis of it. The queen um, in the ant colony, the army ants, I think some of the other um, uh, species that Daniel was sharing with us. It has in his book. Um, and of course in bees, right? The queen bee, we, a, a system where, um, you have all these behaviors. And so once there's a queen in there, um, and you are undergoing sexual reproduction, I think that, you know, there's, um, it might be kind of, again, this is like on territory I'm not as familiar with, but my intuition is that there's more complexity in, um, in a lot of those systems, uh, that include queens, like the division of labor can even be more sort of um, distinct in some ways. And it's probably that the mm -hmm. clonal raider ants, in this case, let go of the queen. They've, they, they might be heading towards this scenario, right, where they're becoming um, sort of more brittle and, we're, and they're kind of decaying in some of that um, complexity. And, and that's, I mean, I guess another fascinating question here is, did the worms sort of bring that back by influencing that behavior? Um, and, and then, we can start to even consider going from symbi or from parasitism to symbiosis. The two mm -hmm. species get addicted to each other. So it's not just this kind of um, 
facultative scenario where the worms can actually do fine without the ants. The ants seemingly would like to do this without the worms, but now they give each other resources in a new way that sort of they both species move forward. And that speaks to the symbiosis that you see a lot of insect systems as well. So I don't know if that's a great answer to the question, um, but the answer is yes, all of the above is possible um, in these systems and, and gets at exactly the complexity that we're, that we're trying to um, lift up and highlight here. But in theory, workers have these changes because they're fed a certain, to make a queen, you feed what? Royal jelly to a worker, right? And then yeah. becomes a queen. So it's turning on some genes, right? It's got a transcriptional activator chemical. <laughs> yes, it's all there. And so it's how a subset yeah. of in the colony go undergo that yeah. developmental switch. And remember, we saw this on Twivo 97, the fungi can do a, a developmental switch. There's, there's in this filamentous fungi, one cells out of 10, if they're both starved of their usual meal and there's a presence of nematode worms, they flip that developmental switch in that case to make these you know, trap cells, which are almost like spider webby, like adhesive structures within that multi-filament um, or like lassos that are catching the worms and constricting around them. And so this, yeah, this can play out in many systems where the genetics are the same, but the developmental program is different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a visit. We have a visitor from uh, Rwanda. Oh, fantastic! Welcome, 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 welcome to uh, Tuivo. Cool. I don't know if we've had anyone from Rwanda before. Yeah, Magali. we're expanding points on the map. This is great. Yeah, love it. Just love it. All right. I think that's it for our questions today. Good ones. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Want to do some pick snails? Yeah, great idea. So my um, pick of the week is maybe another sort of extreme uh, evolutionary scenario. This was a, um, a thread that I saw on Twitter um, mm -hmm. from um, Anne the Gnome at Anne the Gnome. Um, and it, she's got this great, they've got this great um, thread on fungi in space. I've got fungi on the brain here from our last couple Twebos. Um, it's actually lichen. So this is a conglomeration of both um, fungi and usually algae. Um, but actually this sort of <laughs> wild observation that um, a species of lichen, the elegant sunburst lichen, was found growing outside of the International Space Station, right? So talk about an extreme environment. No oxygen, um, <laughs> but sunlight. So the possibility to do photosynthesis and these lichens and these, again, sort of genomes colliding, algae and fungi in this case, or other sort of related species, um, have these really um, sort of resilient life histories. This is one example. And so I've got this link um, to kind of a, a, a fun um, thread on Twitter that kind of steps through some of this and links to some of the research that actually is trying to get to the bottom of how this might be working. Of course, you know, some of the space exploration enthusiasts, as people think about <laughs> potential colonies on the moon or on Mars, are sort of perking up because this gets at, you know, you got to grow something out there um, in order to sort of sustain or find a, a resources or energy um, to go forward. And so this might sort of have some interesting clues about how that may or may not be possible. Nice. That's cool. Fungi in space. Check out that link. <laughs> <laughs> how about you, Vincent? What's your science pick of the week? All right, so I have a paper in, in Nature Communications about polar bears, which <laughs> I think is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, I don't see many polar bear papers. Um, <laughs> I don't look for them that often, but actually um, uh, Amy Rosenfeld sent me this. She thought it would be interesting, hmm. and it's called Polar Bear Energetic and Behavioral Strategies on Land with Implications for Surviving the Ice Free Period. As you know, polar yeah. bears live in ice environments, and we're, the Arctic sea ice is declining. So the polar bears are moving to land. Yep. And you know, uh, as a species, they have to do that or they're going to be extinct. And so one hopes there's enough diversity in the population to sustain that, right? Because not every polar bear is going to have the right mutations. Oh, yeah, that's right. To survive right. on land. And so um, on land, they have a different diet, and they it's thought that that is not as calorific as in the ocean. And so they have to have minimal activity or minim minimize their activity. So this paper is very interesting because they measure the the daily energy expenditure, uh, the diet, the behavior, the movement, and body composition changes of 20 different polar bears on mm -hmm. land 
over uh, 19 to 23 days in August to September to August 2019 to September 2022 in Manitoba, Canada. And they put sensors on the bears. And actually, some of them, they have cameras on them. And there, there are a couple of movies uh, in this, which you can see. Oh, wow. It's really cool. Because the cameras are, I guess, around their neck. And you can see their mouths eating different things <laughs> <laughs> as they're moving around to different land base. I mean, one guy is chewing on some antlers or something. <laughs> you know? It's very cool. Yeah. I mean, I probably like the movies more than anything else. But um, <laughs> they show that on land, polar bears have a five- um, and at point two uh, decrease in um, they have a five point two fold range in um, daily energy expenditure and a nineteen fold range in activity, hmm. um, uh, to which are comparable to uh, active bears on sea ice, which they've also measured. And they tell you what yeah. they eat. Did you want to know what bears eat? <laughs> they eat berries, vegetation, birds, bones, antlers, seal, and Beluga. Yeah. But uh, 19 of those 20 bears lost weight on land. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, there you go. So this is an example of one of these, you know, I would put it as a like uncontrolled experiment in nature as the environment changes a massive test for the persistence of this species, which is already pretty endangered, right? This is, yeah. Wow. This gets at, it uh, puts yeah. in stark relief what the, what some of these um, populations are up against. So they say that, you know, the, our work shows that polar bears have plasticity, but mm -hmm. they still are going to starve because it's not good enough on land. They can catch way more in the ocean. I mean, yep. berries for that huge honking polar bear? <laughs> no way. Give That's me, right. he's, the bears are like, I need a good steak, <laughs> you know, of some sea mammal or something. But I guess yeah. they, they eat penguins a lot, right? Yep. Yeah. So the richness of a penguin, a seal, or a beluga whale compared to foraging um, or subsisting um, as the sort of you know the sort of life histories of that species is pretty out of balance with the with some of the necessary you know, resource gathering that's going on here and uh, a pretty stark example of shifts in behavioral strategies yeah. in this population. Yeah, it's really. I just thought some, uh... Yeah, it's really important to read this and to think about um, all of the uncontrolled experiments that our species is um, facilitating right now as we look at climate change. I was just reading before we got on, um, you know, how um, warm winter has been this year in the Midwest, um, where I'm from originally, Minneapolis, um, the lack of snow. Um, some behavioral changes of humans. When I was growing up there in high school, we had, you know, cross-country ski teams. And even then, we we're starting to see um, meets where instead of cross country skiing, people were running around with poles. So it was like cross country running with ski poles because there just wasn't enough snow to ski on. This year is a pretty stark example of that. Um, yeah, we're, uh, we're, we're putting our it's thumb really, on the scale. It's unfortunate, but uh, it probably inevitable. I don't see reversing this. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Andrew says, Penguin, how do you get the silver paper off? <laughs> 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 you have to ask the polar bear. It's really a yeah. shame what's happening to not just that environment, but many other environments, right? Of course. Um, yep. Massive um, sort of selective pressure that's that's across, uh, hmm. we're seeing hints of across the board here and in, in yeah. only increasing in intensity. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that'll do it. Uh, no penguins in the Arctic. Seals. Okay. That's they right. don't eat penguins. Thank you, Peter. See yes. that? I don't. As soon as I get out of viruses, I don't know anything. <laughs> we're uh, doing our best, but we're I'm just like every need, other person on the street. <laughs> That's right. Um, so seals, okay. Polar bears, seals and belugas. Seals. Yeah, seals no and whales. Where are the penguins anyway? They're where are the penguins? South, South Pole. Yeah, Antarctica. Oh, see, Southern Hemisphere. That's right. Uh, are there polar bears in the Southern Hemisphere? Where do polar north. bears live? The north, but I'm not going to go on the record whether they've Arctic. Uh, yeah, they're in the Arctic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. They are not found in on the South Pole. There you go. Even though they're similar environments, mm -hmm. um, but you know, an interesting experiment would be. <laughs> well, I'm not advocating this. I'm just saying <laughs> it would be interesting to take some polar bears and put them down in the South Pole. Well, so they would probably pick up on penguins. Uh, <laughs> that yeah, they would, change, but I'm just yeah. thinking. 
the, the South Pole is not just winter all the time. It thaws a lot, right? There's mm-hmm. land sticking out. So I wonder how the polar bears uh, would deal with that. Uh, where some of where you can probably the best place to think about some of these um, interfaces are probably in zoos. I actually saw I've seen polar bears at two zoos recently. So both here <laughs> in Salt Lake, and then was in last week I was in Kansas City giving a seminar at the Stowers Institute, in KC, a fascinating place where science is unfolding. But we stopped by the Kansas City Zoo both to see the polar bears, but also, also it turns out the um, Hogel Zoo here in Salt Lake just donated or um, transferred their elephants to got an upgrade mm. at the Kansas City Zoo. So we actually saw the two elephants that um, you know we've seen over the years here in Salt Lake in KC, like mm-hmm. first class accommodations compared to the small sort of enclosures here. And talked to the zookeeper who came from Salt Lake and is now living temporarily in KC to help that transition. And so. Um, yeah, unfortunately for some of these endangered species, right, the zoos are sort of one of the refuges of where resources are sort of more manageable, yeah, but yeah. opens up all kinds of other all right, So Peter there. says, too much sea ice at the South Pole for polar bears. Okay. Yep. yep. And uh, Christer says, is there a cumulative effect mm. of XX chromosomes having more telomerase than XY quantitatively? Mm. Great question. I don't know the answer immediately. So a lot of the um, really interesting sex chromosome evolution like the, to really gauge this is happening in Drosophila and fruit flies. But yeah, um, some of the work coming out of um, David Page's lab and others on the human Y chromosome um, in terms of that. Uh, you know, so the decay here is not necessarily in terms like literally the um, chromosomal ends or the telomeres, although that could be part of the conversation, but it's all these sort of gene deserts. And then um, how, yeah, so um, I'm not going to go farther at the moment, just um, uh, since I'm not recalling all the details, but um, some really incredible chromosomal gymnastics happening on sex chromosomes uh, the, and the Y chromosome are the equivalent of that in some of the um, insect systems mm. and other species as well. Yeah. All right. I think that'll do it here, uh, Nels. We don't have any more questions, but that's good. That was a nice stream. Um I don't know how long we've been going. It's 2.17, so like an hour and 17 minutes. Cool. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. And we'll be back. It won't be a month. We'll be back, I think, in a, about a week or in a half or so. Let me give the for, exact date. Yeah. I have it here, right? Oh, good. Yeah. Let Is me that... get uh, my calendar here. So we are in February. Uh, in two weeks, yeah, f- Tuesday, February 27, 1 p.m. Eastern, we will have another Twivo live stream. Okay. February 27th. So it's in two weeks and we're doing that so that we can get a hundred in Texas. <laughs> That's right. Twivo 99 as a uh, appetizer for Twivo 100 March 10th down at the science mill in Johnson city, Texas. Yeah. All right. That's Twivo 98. Uh, you can find show notes at microbe.tv slash Twivo. Uh, if you have any questions or comments or picks, you could email them to Twivo at microbe.tv. Uh, and um, as I said before, if you enjoy our work, please support us financially. It doesn't have to be a huge amount. It would be a couple bucks a month, which is probably less than you spend on coffee or whatever else, you know. And I'm not saying that you should forego <laughs> your coffee, but it's a good cause. Stuff, programs like this, microbe.tv slash contribute. Nels LD is at cellvolution.org and L Early Bird on Twitter. Thanks, Nels. Thank you, Vincent. Yeah, fun to be here as we continue to, let's see, what was the phrase? Build spaces to celebrating science. Spaces celebrating science. And thank here. you to everyone who is here today for the questions, the conversation, the feedback. Yeah, let's thank That's, our moderators. Bart, yeah. Bart Mac, Les, Steph, SF, um, uh, Tom was here, Andrew, even um, Peak. Uh, Peak Peak <laughs> was here for a while. Thank you all for joining us, and thanks, everyone, uh, on the stream for coming. By the way, um, we will have another stream tonight. Office hours, 8 p.m. Eastern, same place, uh, with Michael Schmidt, our guests, nice. who talk all about microbes. Ask, nice. ask him questions. He, he loves it, loves to talk. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at microbe.tv. The music you hear on Twivo, let me start playing it. Ending music is by Trampled by Turtles. 
too loud. I can't talk over it. Let it go. Crank it up. You've been listening to This Week in Evolution, the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. Until then, be curious. All right. Where's my end screen? <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>